a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Let me tell you two stories and see if it is a way that might get us into what the writer of James is trying to tell the church then and now. The first is about the Bloomsburg Fair. You may know that the state of Pennsylvania does not have a state fair. There are two or three regional ones that are a big deal to include one that is in the town where my last church was. And it just began on Friday and it'll go until next weekend. And half the town will move out of town and rent out their house and make all of their, their property tax money for the year off renting out their lawn and their bedrooms and whatever else. The other half of the town will be working at the fair doing all the sorts of things that need to be done with taking tickets and everything else. And it's, it's a really all-American kind of thing. There's, a, there's the, the, the sheep barn and the, the horse shows and the pie contests and the quilt contest and everything you'd imagine that you'd have at an ordinary fair. But there's also the midway, there are the rides and the games that people go to, that sort of thing for, that are especially popular in the evening as entertainment. And those are not run by people in the town. You may or may not know that there are companies whose whole business is coming and being the midway of different fairs, and they go around to different places every week. And there are people whose whole lives are spent working for fair companies, given the way that they live. Obviously, they're not living in a house someplace. Often, they're living in a camper or a trailer that they pull behind their truck or some other way of, of, of living pretty rough, to be honest. And it came to be known gradually that these people were, were lacking some basic things. You might imagine that working in this kind of job requires clothes that are pretty tough because they end up getting torn and soiled in all sorts of ways. And you need good boots and good gloves and all sorts of, of heavy stuff that isn't cheap. And if you're going from one place to the next, it's really hard to keep doctor's appointments and dentist's appointments and deal with other problems in your life. And so the church that I served and other churches in town began to realize that people had needs and they could perhaps help meet them. They began on a very small scale with a couple of tables on the day before the fair giving away jeans and boots and whatever else they could collect of, of durable used clothes. Uh, but over the years, it grew and grew and grew to the point where now it takes over the entire show barn. And it's not just giving away clothes, it's also toiletries and bed linens and things like setting up dentist's appointments. They managed to con one of the dentists in town into doing this where he would see all of these people who would come in in a very short time, must have been very hectic, blood pressure checks, talking to lawyers about legal details of, of wills and, and legal cases and all kinds of things. All of this so that these people who otherwise would, would live a very itinerant and uh, disconnected, discombobulated sort of life had a little bit of stability. We came to find out that this was on the, the, the circuit that this particular company did with this particular group. This was the only place where that happened. And that in fact, from year to year, obviously there was some turnover of people. It's a, a fairly casual sort of business for many people, but there were people who came back multiple times, and they got to know them. They came again and again, they came with their children, they came with their grandchildren, they came every year. And so a kind of community was formed, even with people who would appear for 10 days and then be gone for a year, or maybe were there for 10 days and were gone forever, we'd never see them again. So somehow there was something built that was important in a way of trusting that this was going to be there. Can you imagine going the whole summer, working through whatever boots and jeans you have, knowing that there will be new boots and jeans waiting for you at the end of September? It's a trusting thing because maybe you don't have money to buy them for yourself. There was also the community that was built among the people who did it. We look forward to this every year. This became a major undertaking to organize this. It started in July, gathering pillows and clothes and everything else you can think of, and everybody's parish hall was full of this stuff. We knew all the other people who did it too. It was a community built just among us. All right, that's story number one. Story number two is a little older and a little further away. It deals with the city of Kobe in Japan. 
I listened to a podcast this week where a, a sociologist from Stanford was talking about two communities in this city, uh, both working class, both near factories where most of the people in the neighborhoods worked. But one neighborhood was, was really tight. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody liked everybody. They worked together. They knew their neighbors. Everything clicked with them. Another neighborhood, that was not the case. They were suspicious of one another. There had been problems. The way the city had developed had, had cut into their neighborhood cohesion as well. And so in 1995, when there was a major earthquake in Japan, and there, the result of that was with huge fires in the city of Kobe, these two neighborhoods responded and weathered that event in very different ways. The neighborhood that was really tight with one another they got organized. They hauled hoses around. They, they brought a bucket brigade up from wherever the water was to try to keep the houses from catching on fire. And in fact, they suffered comparatively less damage than elsewhere in the city because of what they were able to do. The neighborhood that had less trust and less cohesion, they just fled. And their neighborhood was mostly destroyed. The sociologist who was talking about this used this as, as an example of what he called social infrastructure or psychological infrastructure. In other words, they, they trusted each other and so they did things. I mean, it, it's a complicated academic doublespeak, but what it means basically is, I made cupcakes for your birthday. So it means you probably can trust that if you call me, I'll take you to a doctor's appointment or I'll feed your cat when you're away for the weekend. We know each other, we trust each other, we know we can depend on each other. It turns out, when the research is done, that there's some real benefits to this. It turns out that people who are able to trust other people and do trust other people to be honest and basically good and reliable and dependable are generally happier and are more successful in a variety of ways that success can be defined. The sociologist was defining it in terms of economic outcomes, but you can think of it in a variety of other ways as well. There's something to be said for that ability to be a community and be cohesive, to, to, to know and to trust one another that builds something important. And we as religious people wouldn't necessarily put it in psychological terms. We might put it in spiritual terms. Our trust, our ability to depend on one another and on God builds the household of God here among us. I've been talking all through the, the, the podcast I'm doing on Revelation about God's economy, which is our theme for this season. But in terms of managing God's household, a household obviously has to do things like keep the lights on and keep the walls up. But it has to do other things, too, that are what goes on inside that building, what goes on inside whatever the infrastructure is that we have built. It's so important that we remember that those things are what really make the community go. The literal buildings of a neighborhood were saved by the fact that the people in the neighborhood knew and trusted each other. So all of that, and take that and compare that then with what we hear in the letter of James. I'll be right up front with you. We don't know who the writer of James was writing to. We don't know if it was a particular community or if that person was writing in general to the church. It seems like there are an awful lot of specific things in there, some of which are, are pretty dramatic, to think that maybe this person knew who he or she was writing to and so was trying to make particular points. It kind of makes you stop and, and think for a minute when it says, you want something and can't have it, so you commit murder. You're going to kill somebody for their shoes. I, I hope not. But it certainly paints a picture of a community where there appears to be not a whole lot of trust, where there appears to be not a whole lot of cohesion. And that writer, I think, is calling them and us to recognize how important that is. And when we see it, in whatever form it may be, however strong or weak it may be among us, to nurture it, to give thanks for it when we find it, and to try to build it up. 
It's only by having that, that, that faith, and that is truly what we're talking about here, is faith in God and faith in other people that we are able to be truly God's household. It's only when we are each able to recognize that when we encounter anyone else, we are encountering Christ in that person. And when we encounter anyone else, we are bringing Christ to that person as well that we will truly recognize the extent to which the Holy Spirit moves among us and is trying as best the Holy Spirit can to build those connections among us. If those don't exist, there's absolutely no reason why we should continue to try to keep the walls up and keep the lights on. But if we feel that, there's an intense pull in it. There's something in it that we want more of. Whenever the Holy Spirit is really cranking away. Were you in this building this morning between 8 and 10.30? Or 9 and 10.30? There was just way too much going on this morning. I kept getting pulled out of one thing to go do something else. There was a Nuri meeting. There was novel theology. There was the immunization clinic. There was the quilt raffle and other teasers for the bazaar. There was confirmation going on downstairs. There was the pickup choir going on here. There were half a dozen other conversations going on, people in and out of different uh, contact with people. All of this stuff going on. Could you feel the Spirit moving here this morning? I certainly could. I mean, the Spirit was moving so much this morning, I will have a nap this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I hope a few of you need a nap too. That's what's supposed to happen. And that we feel that, that is when we know why it is that we keep coming back here and why it is that this place is important to us and to our community. And that is where we come back to God's economy in the way that we're talking about. I'll tell you another story. The person who told me the story is not here, so I can tell it and then she can blame me for it later. She said that in a church that she attended, uh, the junior warden, and you, you may know the junior warden is normally given the job of taking care of the property of the church, the buildings and grounds and so on. When they came to their season of stewardship, they asked the junior warden to get up and say something about stewardship, but told him, you may not talk about light bulbs. Because that's what the junior warden would do. You know, if we need to keep this building going, we have to replace the light bulbs and it's expensive. You know, the things you'd expect the junior warden to say. And I guess he was piqued enough by that that he decided he'd get up and talk about light bulbs anyway. So he did. What he said is, this light bulb is the one that shone on my children when they were baptized right here. This is the light bulb that shone on my daughter and son-in-law when they were married right here. This is the light that shines on everyone who comes forward to receive the Eucharist here every time we celebrate it. And he sat down. That, dear friends, is how you talk about the light bulbs and connect it to what we're really doing here. And that, dear friends, is my challenge to you. In a few minutes, we'll get up and we will exchange the peace. If you look around and see people you know and trust, people who you work with, people who you love and care for, I invite you to take that home and let it be a paperweight on your desk when you consider what your giving intentions for next year are going to be. If you, like me, felt like a pinball this morning and going from one thing to the next and couldn't decide where to put your energy, there was so much going on here this morning, I invite you to take that home and put it on your desk and look at it again when you think about what your support for St. Thomas's will be. If there is any way that you feel the Holy Spirit moving here, if there's any reason why you go home exhausted by the efforts of the Holy Spirit every time you come here, or energized, or both, I invite you to take that home and let it be there with you as you decide what you will do next year. A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Remember, the peace of God is lived out in everything that we do here. It is not sitting still, it is moving, it is growing, always and in all of our hearts. 
We have only to accept what it is God has already begun doing in us. Build it up, nurture it, give thanks for it. And the Holy Spirit will truly be unleashed here in ways we cannot even imagine. Let us hope that will be what happens. I commend it all to you. Amen.